also going to share the screen. So we're going to share because we're going to do this to Hillim. So we're doing this is to Hillim. Um, you, everybody can see, right? So this is to Hillim 114. So if you look in Hallel, which is a very beautiful um, composition of praises to Hashem, and it's all based on what David Amelech writes, I figured we should do this one. But say Yisrael maybe trying. We should do the one that talks about when the Jewish people leave. Mitzrayim. Okay, so it's a, it's just a very beautiful uh, idea. It really shows us like what, what was beautiful about the leaving of Egypt is really God's huge manifestation of who he is, all the miracles that he can do. It's God showing you like you think nature is its own, um, you know, has its own mother, okay, mother nature, but the real, you know, force behind nature is me. And therefore, you see, like the ten, the ten plagues that Hashem sends to the Egyptians, turns them on their head. Like it turns everything upside down. But it's interesting; it turns it upside down according to the way they treated the Jewish people. Okay, so it's all what we call mida keneged mida. It's all measure for measure. And so it's a big difference because man, until this time, it's interesting, sort of looks at Hashem as a force behind the world, not really so into the world, like almost as if Hashem is like so above us, you know, that he really wouldn't want to even bother with people. So that's kind of like what happens. It's almost like the world sort of believes, okay, God created the world. He, you know, left behind it, his messengers, his forces to keep it in check, the sun, the moon, the water, the fire, the land, all this kind of stuff. But Hashem himself, personally involved in the individual lives of 7 billion people on the planet, for a lot of people, that's hard to believe. So the story of Mitzrayim really tries to bring that out a lot, tries to really bring out what we call Hashkacha Pratis. Like all of us, thank God, we're all big believers in this. And the idea of Hashkacha Pratis and is for you to really keep an eye on it, like to really look at it in your life, do you know what I mean? And, and that, this like actual, what would I say, acknowledgement of the fact that God is in your life, to really look at him that way, that's the greatest redemption that you can have. Because what we were saying when we say, the word Mitzrayim always means narrow, like constrained. Sometimes we're narrow in our understanding. We really are. Like we have a very like, what's the word? Myopic, limited view, right? That's this whole idea of, you know, the idea of looking in the keyhole and you see Albert Einstein on all fours and he's going woof, woof, woof. And you're like, how could the genius of the, of the you know, generation, the man of uh, the millennia, like how could he be sitting, you know, laying on, the, uh, kneeling on the floor, going woof, 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 pretending he's a dog, right? Because you're looking through the keyhole. And then when you open the door, what do you see? He's playing with his grandchild. Just the perspective is so much bigger. So this is the thing. But say, Yisrael Mi Mitzrayim, when Hashem took us out of this very constraint view, right? Beis Yaakov Me Amlo Eis, from a nation that had strange speech, so this is an important point. The strange speech the rabbis say that the nation had was that they put people down. They were very, very um, egotistical. The speech was always about how great they are and how low everyone else is. This is like a really uh, indicator. This is a real indicator of the kind of person you are. And really, if you have to put other people down to put yourself up, then that really means you don't have a lot of value for yourself. You don't have a lot of understanding of your own self-worth. So the Jewish people really, it's an interesting thing how much Hashem cares that we use our speech not to put people down, but really to empower and inspire others, right? And for you to enslave someone, like it, it's so sad, like when you hear about people who bully, you know, like when you think about the people who bullied you, like they bullied you in school or bullied you at camp and bullied you and, and, and it just continues, it perpetuates. And it's really like these people with their like taunts, right? They actually enslave the other person. 
right? They enslave them. They're so, you become so afraid of them. And, and, you know, what are they doing and where are they going? And am I going to meet them? And are they going to say that thing about me? And are they going to embarrass me in public? And blah, 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 blah. That's really what bullying is. Sometimes people bully more with words than they even bully. Like, you know, I'm going to beat you up and steal your lunchbox. You know, they bully you with the words and they make you feel so terrible. So that to us is actually this word, um, low A's, doesn't only mean foreign speech it means like barbaric and savage because that kind of person is really what the Torah would say is a murderer do you know what I mean it's a savage way to speak to speak in a way that you enslave another person with fear right of feeling that you are always going to publicly humiliate them right? You fill them with, with um, shame. That's what you really do. You fill them with shame. So it's an interesting idea that this was the kind of culture that Egypt had. And it makes sense because only people who had that kind of culture could feel good enslaving other people. So here the Jewish people are saying like, yes, you took us out of this. And then Hashem like turns us around. And with the Torah, if you really think about it, like your speech becomes very holy and your speech is another whole essence of your soulful self, the whole Ruach. And what you do with speech is enormous. It's really considered enormous. Today, you're living in a world where it's like so polluted. So um, there is no, uh, what's the word? respect for another human being. People just shout you down. You know what I mean? They scream at you, they yell at you. Politicians, politically, what is going on is, it's incredibly shameful. Like people are not embarrassed to lie publicly, openly, to make up anything to destroy another per person's reputation, right? And now with social media and all this other stuff, it's like on steroids. It's on steroids, right? So it's just something for us to think about. So here we're being grateful, like we're singing a whole song. Yay, Hashem, you took us out of these kinds of constraints and you took us away from these kinds of people and you made us understand that we could be such, you know, so much better than all of this. So this was an incredibly joyful moment, not only for the Jews, but for the whole world, because during this time of Yitzhiyah Mitzrayim, then God is revealing himself, not just in a way that you have to sit there and go, wow, the Hashgacha Pratis, I met exactly this person at that time. What are the statistical probabilities? Like this is open-ended, woohoo, miracles that the world is seeing. It's just interesting. So what does this mean? So here we're talking about the, the different Shvatim, the different uh, tribes. So Yehuda is his holy one. So, you know, we always say that Yehuda is set aside for Malchus, for the leadership of the Jewish people. That's where it comes from, right? And Yehuda and the Jewish people, they're both going to serve Hashem. They're both part of the um, nation of the Jewish people. But what do we know that Yehuda leads the nation and the nation? Like, in other words, whoever is a king in, in a king or a leader in Paul Yisrael in the Jewish people, what do they have to know? That they represent God to the people, right? And the people to God. So they're sort of like, in the middle, that's what they are. They're in the middle. They're sort of the, the conduit that's going back, that's you know allowing that flow of the relationship going back and forth. Okay. So it's interesting, you know, this idea of it's say Israel made me strong, like the fact that Hashem took us out of Egypt, we mentioned this like a million times. Like, you know, whenever we make Kiddush, we talk about it. It's a theme, like in every single Jewish holiday. It's a theme in Rosh Hashanah, it's a theme in Yom Kippur, it's a theme on Shabbos, it's a thing that just keeps going on. Okay, so a theme Pesach, it makes sense because that's exactly when things like this happened, right? Even in Sukkot, it makes sense because Hashem took us out of Mitzrayim and he, we we like were in in those booths, you know, we were in the sukkahs. So you could see where it all flows. But when you stop and you ask yourself, like every single holiday, what does every single holiday have to do with Yitzhiyah Mitzrayim? So the idea, again, is always being taken out of what is constraining you. So for Rosh Hashanah, like you're beginning a whole new year, right? Yom Kippur, you want to get rid of all of the mistakes that you may have made. So you can see in a way the idea of Mitzrayim, and it's something that we can kind of like 
uh, reflect on in our own selves. Like you can sometimes stop and you can say, you know, like Hashem, I really feel constrained. Like I can't find what I need. I'm feeling lost. I feel like things are coming in on me. I'm very overwhelmed. Do you ever use that expression? Like this time of year, being overwhelmed is, is very common, right? There's just like a lot of things to do, right? Organize this and organize that and shop this and turn your kitchen over. And like, you can see like, ah! So, you know, it's so funny that here you are feeling so overwhelmed. So what are you supposed to be doing? Taking deep breath and say, but say, like Hashem, only you, like calm me down. You know, and not, not, you know, like I always say, don't let perfect get in the way of good. Like I know so many people whose lives are so, um tense they're so intense because everything always has to be perfect right so when things have to be perfect even good is overlooked like it's you know sometimes good enough is good enough you know what i mean and so this is just like important ideas especially during this time of year okay so to keep on thinking and then even again when you're ever feeling it's not this time of year and it's just during the year right just to feel like you know what Hashem let me out of my constraints so it's interesting Shabbos is that day of rest it's a complete like witness you know that we testify that we really believe in Hashem we're not worried if we're not working 24 7 we're okay we put ourselves in his hands and we mimic what Hashem did like really there is such a um such a reality there's such a thing it's actually a thing this concept of resting what is resting for. like people like unmute like why did Hashem put this idea of rest into the week anybody have any like ideas why do you think there's rest to give you energy for the rest of the yes. week okay first of all because really you need to have energy a hundred percent so it's a way to recharge your battery but another perspective is you need to stop and take pleasure in what you have accomplished you know like you know, sometimes people just feel like, you know, you wake up like 10 years later, you know what I mean? Like, you know, it's like suddenly it's your birthday. <laughs> I'm laughing because I have a lot of these girls that I train and they're like a little on the hysterical side because they're turning 40. Okay. So there's like a few of them going, oh my gosh, you know, and it's so cute to hear like, you know, your birthday's really, I'm really six weeks younger than you. you know? <laughs> like, I'm not 40 yet, and I'm laughing, you know? So I keep telling them like 40 was an amazing time this today one of them walked in and she asked me like why was 40 so amazing like I'm kind of nervous about it I said first of all at 40 I think you still have a lot of your um, vigor like it's not like at 40 60 is a little different okay 40 you still feel like woohoo you don't have as many aches and pains right as you do later on but what the good point of 40 is you can look at at a lot of accomplishment like it's a nice time to sort of take a deep breath like I told her take a deep breath and look back see how much you accomplished you know what I mean and Amir Sasham you know going forward you'll accomplish that much more but there is a concept of like stopping like Hashem says like stop don't create anything new take pleasure in what was created you know what I mean take pleasure and that pleasure that you'll take in what was created take pleasure in Shabbos take pleasure in the spiritual take pleasure I did what I had to do physically and now Hashem I get to just be with you right in my community and my prayer and my this and my that and that pleasure is going to take you going forward so the same thing like same thing with Pesach, like for some people, I'm, you know, they're making their own Seder, you know, when you make your own Seder, sometimes like there's a real pleasure in, you know, putting your hands into it, your own creativity, right? And then when you get to the Seder, ah, wow, like, look what I've accomplished, right? That's what, that's what this is about. Not to like get all frustrated and think about, oh, what's, what do I still have to do? What do I still have to do? What do I, yeah, like, let's uh, take it easy, you know, Bar Hashem, look what I accomplished all right so very beautiful so when it says here it's interesting when it talked about judah becomes his holy one and, and israel his dominion like in other words what is this trying to tell you it's saying you left the land of is of egypt sorry you left this barbaric place you left this foreign speech you left this place that puts people down to now serve hashem 
Okay, that's what you're here for. You're really here to serve Hashem. And Hashem is telling you, you serve me, right? Then you are in a comfortable place because your soul is connected to my soul. It's not strange speech. It's actually the speech that you really want to have. It's actually what I would call like your authentic self. Your authentic self is soulful and godly, right? The body and all these things distract you. They try to make you be something you really aren't. Really, our go-to position is good. Do you know what I'm saying? That's who we really are down deep. That's who we really are. Okay, somebody better be online. I don't see a single face. Is anybody going to put their face out? <laughs> I need a face. <laughs> Anyone want to volunteer? <laughs> anyway, okay. I'll just look at my face. <laughs> okay, but it's just like a beautiful idea. So it's like, you've moved. This is what like, I find sometimes hard. Thank you, Talia, for coming back. I'm blowing you a kiss. Okay, <laughs> that was very nice. I'm serious. Okay, good girl. So it's sometimes very hard, like this idea of moving, like sometimes it will, people say like, what was the big deal to be free from Egypt if we just ended up being enslaved to Hashem? You're not slave to Hashem. You're here to serve Hashem. The, 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 the reality is you have that choice. You can serve Hashem when you want to serve Hashem. You can walk out on Hashem. You could do this. There will be a consequence because there's a consequence to anything you do, even when you serve Paro. There's a consequence to anything that anyone does, right? So that's the natural way of the world, right? For every action, there is a reaction. That's a, you know, a physics reality that Hashem put in, right? But there is a difference, okay? There's a difference between being a slave and being a servant, all right? So Talia, you want to ask something? Is Shabbat also about self-reflection and reflection on your relationships? Yes, your yes, for sure, for sure, for sure, for sure. Like to enjoy them, you know what I mean? To enjoy them, not to like sit there and be upset about them. That's not because Hashem is saying like, it's not a time of a change. It's not to sit there and go, okay, you know, this time I'm going to do this next week and I could do that. It's just like, you know, I have this person, really the greatest relationship to really reflect on on Shabbos is the one you have with Hashem, right? Because that's going to be honestly the seat of all your relationships. Like, it's very interesting. I was like talking to somebody today, like for the kids, like it's really tough. Like marriage is only getting tougher. It's not getting simpler. It's getting more complicated. And I don't know if people are as prepared and you're, you're not in a society that really defines marriage very positively. Statistics are against you. Everything is so little. And whenever you learn like, you know, about marriage, like if we're going to talk about reflection and this idea of Hashem in your relationship, like God tells you right up front, up front, if you get married and it's an ish and an isha, right? A man and a woman, right? The two letters that are sim like that are different in this word, ish and isha, ish has an extra yud, right? And isha has a hey. Yud Hey is the name of Hashem. If you keep God and his perspective and his moral uh, reality and his goals in mind, then you'll be able to navigate through the marriage. If you don't, you pull God out, it just turns into a ball of fire and everybody's like ready to burn the next one. So it's just interesting. Like that's Shabbos is a good time to sit down and kind of look at your life and say, you know what, Hashem, I really want to invite you in it, in all places. Because the minute I remove you from relationships, my good friends, my parents, like, like Hashem, like, you know, he uh, lines it up for you. He really lines it up for you here, like ideas of relationships, right? Honor your parents, okay? If you honor your parents, it's going to be good for you and good for them and good for everybody. You're going to be disrespectful to your parents. You see what kind of world you're in right now. Do you know what I mean? Right? All these ideas. Love your fellow man. You know, which love your fellow man means look to give to them. You know, look to be there for them. You're looking to be there for them. They look to be there for you. It's a much better world. Do you see what I'm saying? The minute we take, what does it say? Why? Because I told you. Why? Because Hashem, I know. I know better, right? I know what conflict, like, I don't know. You, you just can't even open up the news, right? They're like, I think it was another shooting in a mall. Like people, there are, people are becoming completely unhinged, right? Walking into stores, just shooting, looting, killing. Like it's great. Like they wanted to, somebody was saying that in Miami, there was a big, there was a big, uh, 
people went the you know college students went for vacation and it turned out that in this big group of college students there was like 70 of them had weapons two people got killed and shot like so the mayor of I forgot which part of Florida he governor or mayor he actually begged that they should um, stop spring bit break he doesn't want spring break anymore because all these kids come here and they act like animals in Florida and then they're picking up the pieces do you know what I mean so it's just like we don't have it anymore. So Shabbos is a really good time like to stop and say, you know what? I got this issue with my relationship, this, this, this. I'm going to put you into the picture. And, you know, it's very interesting. How do you see that this is so true? Because the Yetzirah works the hardest right before Shabbos, always. He tries to get people to walk into Shabbos really mad at each other. <laughs> you know, you took the shower. You weren't ready. You didn't make the table. You forgot my shirt. You bought me flowers that are wilted. You know, what I mean? like you know, blah, blah, like so many things to be you know angry and screaming and this and that about. So these are important you know things that we need to think about. It's like especially now, like you want to get to the seder. It's not easy. Like, you know, people, it's going to be a big mix of all kinds of people. We've been talking about it and we have to really be prepared. You know, like this sister-in-law doesn't really love that sister-in-law so much. And nah, you know, and this mother-in-law is looking at this daughter-in-law and this brother-in-law is a little bit jealous of that brother-in-law. Like these are real stories. These are not, you know what I mean? It's not from nowhere, right? So we have to know before we get in, but say, Hashem can take us out of these constraints and that this is all about relationships, right? And this is the time to think. And the greatest relationship I better think about first and foremost is put Hashem in the picture. How does Hashem want me to act with this daughter-in-law? How does Hashem want me to act with this uh, uh, grocer at the Sobeys? How does Hashem want me to act at the job? You know, like that's the reality of all of our relationships. So here was a very interesting thing. It says here, Hayam ra'a v'yanes hayardain yisa v'yachor. So the sea saw them and fled. Okay, so what is, which sea are we talking about? Anybody have any idea? What sea are we talking about? The Jewish people come out of Egypt and now they're trapped by the? Yamsuf. Yes, excellent. Okay, so we're trapped by the Yamsuf. Okay, so now that we're trapped by the Yamsuf, right? It's an interesting idea. Now think smart here, right? So Moshe is like, come on, Yamsuf, you got to split for me. Okay, and the Yamsuf's like, Mah. okay, then it says, come on, Yamsuf, he holds up the stick. You know, you got to split for me. Right, the Jewish people are crying out, come on, Yamsuf, nothing, it's not moving. And then suddenly by Yanos and it, it turns, it runs. What is it? What is it? What did he see that he ran? So the only other time you see this word by Yanos, you don't see it's not a common word. It's only written one more place. And that's in the Chumash when it talks about the story of Yosef and Ashes Potiphar. So Yosef like works in this home of Potiphar. That's the name of the guy he works for, all right? And he is a, a, an incredible person. You could see Yosef is outstanding because wherever he is, you know what Yosef has a very high emotional intelligence. He has a very high emotional intelligence because people with a high emotional intelligence are the ones who are promoted, especially in people service kind of places. Okay, so he's got like high emotional intelligence. He's always gonna strive to be the best under any circumstances. He's not a fetcher. This is not the kind of person who bemoans, oh my gosh, why me, why me? He lives in the moment. This is my moment. This is my mitzvah. This is what I do. I take one step forward and I take it with, which is hard to believe when you go through what he goes through, a smile. And how does he learn to smile? By being concerned with other people's service. Instead of being self-absorbed and spending the whole day like, oh my gosh, oh me, me, me. He's always looking to help other people. So when you're looking to help other people, it gives you a high. It's a way to get endorphins and adrenaline. Most of all, it's to become a godly person. But I'm just trying to show you like psychologically, spiritually, and emotionally what is happening when you are that type of person. So that's the kind of guy he is. So what happens? He's very loyal to his master. Meanwhile, the master's wife is not very loyal to her husband. And we said Yosef is an amazingly good looking guy. This is Egypt. Okay. Egypt is not, is the bedrock of immorality. 
all right? This is not a moral group of people. These are people who, you know, party 24 seven. That's all it was about for them. So she's after Yosef. That's all she wants is she wants Yosef. A day in, day out. Like they say, she never wore the same outfit. She's forever flirting with him, forever trying to get him to notice her. Like it's a nonstop kind of passion. All right. So it's, it's wearing on this poor guy is a 17 year old hormone man. And it's like wearing on him, wearing on him, wearing on him. So he he's able to like control himself. It's like a miracle. No one else is in the house. And she's like really going after him. So he, you know, he doesn't know what to do with himself. And Bar Hashem, they say he looks in the mirror. And who did he look like? Exactly like his father, Yaakov. He sees the spitting image of Yaakov in the mirror. And he realizes I was made for more. I'm not going to give into this. And she's like runs after him. She grabs his coat. And what does it say? Vayanos Yosef, Yosef ran. And not only did he run, he did something that is in, in some ways very, very, um, uh, what's the word? It's a, it, it was almost like kind of a dangerous act. He took his coat off and he left it in her hands. Why was that dangerous? Because that was the evidence that she had to say, you see, he tried to rape me. He tried to get me. Look, I have his coat, right? If he would have ran without the coat, like he could have given her a push, right? And ran away. Then all she would have is her like screaming, like, well, ah, you said, and then, you know, he could have said, I don't know what you're talking about. I was never here, blah, blah, blah. No evidence. He left the evidence behind. Why? So that he shouldn't touch her. He didn't want to have anything to do with her. And two, this is crazy. The Torah tells you that he had a lot of gratitude to his master. He didn't want to make a whole scene of this and, and push her and do this and do that. He didn't want any of that kind of thing happening. But he took the risk and she played it. Like he left the coat and she used it against him later. Okay. But he, by Yonas, he ran. So what did the Yamsuf see? So Moshe's prayer wasn't good enough. His stick wasn't good enough. The Jewish people's prayer wasn't good enough. So we say, you know, what's his name? Um, Nachshon, he jumped into the water. But more than him even jumping into the water, what first got the water to even say, okay, we're going to consider this story is that they had taken the, the coffin of Yosef with them. Yosef begged them, do not leave me in Egypt. Make a promise to me, you'll take me out. When the Jewish people were getting all of the riches, right? Um, during the plague of darkness, Moshe was very busy getting the coffin out of, I think it was sunk in the bottom of the Nile. And I think Moshe got it out and up and he was the one who took it. Okay. Now, when the Yamsuf saw this um, coffin and they remembered Yosef, then they said, okay, these are outstanding people. And the merit of Yosef, right, and his greatness and the fact that he ran and, you know, got out of there and split the scene, so to speak, right, then they did that for the Jewish people. So it's also a very beautiful idea. So here... Also, it says like it's interesting. So the sea saw them, the Jordan ran backward. Okay, so this is prophetic. This is like a thank you of prophecy, like where we're saying thank you in the future when the Jewish people are going to cross into the land of Israel and Yehoshua is now the leader, the Jordan also splits. The rabbis also say, which is very interesting, that like when the Torah was given and the Jewish people are coming out of Egypt, like the weather, everything is going nuts. Like all of nature is like bubbling over. All of nature is like, whoa, whoa, like everything is jumping and hopping and everything is changing. Like, you know, on Shabbos, last Shabbos, did anybody see this? Like there was this little, like it was like a sudden snowstorm for maybe five minutes. Did anyone notice it last week? Sorry. Yeah, wasn't it weird? Like I looked out the window, I was giving a, a class in shul. I look out the window and I'm like, oh my gosh, what's happening? Like I thought, you know, like how, you know, when Hashem opens the shmaim and dumps all the snow. And I'm thinking that's what's going to happen. And what happened five minutes later? Stop. Yeah, it stopped. Not only did it stop, like the sun came out. You know what I mean? So you could imagine like at these points in history, that's what Hashem did. Okay, we didn't have uh, CNN, Bar Hashem, okay, and Fox News and all this, you know, uh, what's it called, WhatsApp and TikTok and all the other millions of things that spread information in an instant. How did Hashem spread information? He spread it through nature. Like, 
right? They say like where the, the, the waters split everywhere, split in water, people's cups, split everywhere. So everywhere someone is realizing, oh my gosh, something's going on, right? The, the, the mountains are quaking, there's thundering, there's all kinds of stuff going on because the world is being topsy-turvy. Everything that was hidden, Hashem hiding behind the scene is now being revealed. Like a mirza Shem by us, like I only can daven and hope that that would be, I hope we get to see something like that. I really do. I really hope that when Mashiach comes, it's that. It's like, it's not just, you know, it was on the news, but the whole world is like, woohoo, all of earth, you know, shaking and quaking. And yes, Hashem is coming, like that kind of mm -hmm. idea. Okay. Yeah, it would be so beautiful. Okay. Now, let me see what else I want to tell you. Uh, okay. It was interesting. It was interesting. One of the great rabbis that asked, how come like the sea didn't split, let's say in the merit of Avraham. So it's interesting. So they said there was one thing that Avraham did that wasn't correct. So what was that one thing? It's just an interesting idea. It really is. So um, it says like this, when Avraham went to fight against the kings, right, to, to save his son, not his son, his nephew, Lot, right? He took 300 of his students with him, okay? So the Torah tells you, first of all, it wasn't the best idea to take 300 of his students with him who were busy and should have been learning Torah, but okay, he took them. And then it's interesting. Then when he finishes and he wins, then the king of Stone says to him, you know what? Um, I'll take all the people, I'll take all the captives, and you take all the money. And he says, no, I don't want anything. You take all the money. I don't want even like nothing. I'm not touching any of this. I did this all what we call the shame Shemaim. I did this all for the sake of Lot. So the Torah tells you that Hashem was a little disappointed. Like Hashem said, no, you should have said, you take the money, take it. And I'll take the people because I can convert them to Hashem. And it's just an interesting idea. Yeah, it's just an interesting idea. Okay, so now let's do this. Let me see what else there was. Um, okay. Okay. So we told you that about this thing. Okay. 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 Yeah. So we said here. Okay. Let me see the mountains that you, okay. They, that you skip like rams and hills like sheep tremble. O earth at the presence of Hashem at the presence of the God of Jacob. So this is this idea. Like we said, Hashem is revealing, not only revealing himself. Okay. Which was huge, but he revealed the fact that he is the God of Jacob. Do you understand? This was a pivotal point in history. This is a very pivotal point in history. Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim and the giving of the Torah change is history forever. Like it's, it's actually the middle, okay? It's the middle of history, the middle of the change of the world. Because what's happening here? Until this point, Hashem was really giving the world at large an opportunity to be very, very close to him. All right. He doesn't see that it's happening. It doesn't seem like people are choosing God. Right. So finally, he finds a group of people who choose him. OK, the Jewish people chose Hashem. It's really true. Yes, we had, you know, the the grandfathers and the great grandmothers who, you know, influence us like people can be influenced and then they can have a, a trans a trans like a transmission of their um what would I say? People's traditions, their thoughts, their feelings, their, their concepts, right? But you don't have to necessarily take it, right? How many people we can see even till today, right? You know, many Jews, I don't care what their Bubi and Zadie did. You know, you meet them and they'll say, oh, my Zadie, he was a great rabbi in Poland. You know, they tell you the name and you're like, what? That's your Zadie? Like, you know, these great rabbis. Yeah, but uh, you know what I mean? Like, I'm not interested, right? So we really have to appreciate that the Jewish people, and it's not even a huge majority of us, right? The majority of us said no. Majority of us are staying in Egypt. So like this is something I always find very fascinating, right? If it's only one fifth of the Jewish people who come out, it's only 20%, right? But Hashem is saying this 20% is so precious. This 20% is going to change the world. Not only will the world see me as godly, but they will see the Jewish people as godly. There will always be this awe of the Jewish people. And that's what, that is 100% true. 
There's no doubt about it. Like the non-Jewish world can't figure us out for beams, right? Why? Because of this. Because of this. Tremble, O earth, at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob, right? The whole world is like, what's going on? It doesn't make any sense. How could this be? You know what I mean? It's such an interesting idea. Okay, so now, what goes on here? What goes on here? This is an interesting word, this little word. This is the last part. Who turned the rock into a pool of water, the flinty rock into a fountain? So who is this rock that we're talking about? Who's the rock that turns into a pool of water? And when we're talking about a pool of water here or into a fountain, what is this? Is this a good thing or a bad thing? Is it better to be a rock or better to be a, a pool of water? What? Is it better to be a prickly rock or to be a fountain? Which one is better? What's, what's the, like, being turned from a rock to water? What's the difference here? But the water they're both. Is they're both important. Okay, they're both important, <laughs> but which one is kind of more important? In this case, this is the water. water yes, the yes, door. yes. Here is, you're saying halal. Halal means praise and thanks and gratitude. So we have a lot of gratitude here because we were in the eyes of Egypt, nothing but a piece of dirt. That's all we were. That's what Egypt looked at us as. We're dirt. We're absolutely nothing. We have no life to us. When you're a slave, like, you know, they really tortured us. Like, I don't think, you know, it's, it's sad to say, like, it's really sad to say, you really think about it. Like all that stuff about babies being put into the walls of the pyramids, if they didn't have enough bricks, it's true. Okay, we were tortured. I think, like, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Water flows like a mighty stream. It's like everywhere. It just yes, yes. Water is alive and water gives life. A rock is dead. Do you know what I mean? So this is the thing. So Hashem made you. Water is something that can nurture something. Water is something that can give you inspiration, right? So before they were looked at as a dry rock worth nothing. People stepped on us. And now we are a source of life and inspiration, Okay, so it's an interesting idea. You came out, you go down. So what's that tour here? A, a tour here is like that they looked at us, not like a tour, like sometimes we think about a shem, you know, we call him rock, meaning, you know. Oh, yes, I ever. thought a tour is yeah, a, yeah, one that's of the name of a shem. Yeah, so here we're not. Here we're looking at is a tour as like, rock like just dirt you know what i mean like you know when you have levels so tzemach, like it's you know it's not even semach it's below even right below plant life is just dirt right so it's just like nothing we were nothing in their eyes right and hashem took what was nothing and made it alive again like like what barb was saying right it flows it gives life you know it, it's moving before we were just nothing stuck in mitzrayim a rock stuck on the ground in Mitzrayim that they were stepping on us. Okay, so these are the kinds of things, like when you're at the Pesach Seder, these are kind of things you got to think about. And sometimes even in your own life or your friends, it's scary out there. Like sometimes you see people really suffering. You've got to like think to yourself, the story of Mitzrayim, the Jewish people looked like they were lost and Hashem turned it, turned it. And he can change us. It's so interesting. He can help you change. He can help you grow. You can move to a different level. You can, you know, get past the things that stand in your way, right? As long as what? We take him with us, right? Yosef rose to greatness only because he took Hashem with us, with him. That's what we're saying. If Yosef would not have taken Hashem with, us, with him, he would have been a nothing. Like he would have had to sell himself as a, you know, unsneeous person. That's what he would have had to do. Wouldn't have had a choice. Oh, he survived how would he have survived that's what we're trying to say so this is like it's a very i like it like it's first of all it's a nice song if people sing it it's a like a very nice um song of hallel it's a beautiful message to all of us it's a real message of hope it's a real message of you know hashem is behind all the scenes at this point in history he actually revealed himself put himself right up right in front of all of our faces gave incredible miracles for the jewish people you know and and even within those miracles like that was what was so beautiful like you know when they say a Yes, Yamsuf, like, you know, like you could point and say, you know, Zekhe Li, Ve'an, Ve'hu, this is my God, and I, you know, I am enamored 
with him, right? And I praise him. I, him, 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 that's my God. How could people see it? Because everyone had like these different Egyptian taskmasters, right? Some were more cruel, some were less cruel. And they could see how they died, right? When the, the Yamsuf comes back, when it pours back down and drowns all the Egyptians, each Egyptian drowned a different way, right? The better guy fell right to the bottom. The guy who really was a real schmo, he suffered, he bobbed up and down. Like an interesting idea. See, each person could see that hashkacha pratis, right? So not only in the little picture, but even in the big picture, like all the pieces of the puzzle finally were put, back, were put together and totally revealed. And that's what we have to like take pleasure in when we're all sitting at that Pesach Seder. And it, sometimes it's hard, you know what I mean? It's not so easy. But we got to look at ourselves and say, you know what, like the overall, right, the big, big picture, it's all good. And you know what, Hashem, it's a long wait, like thousands of years, we've been waiting and waiting and waiting, but we're not going to let go. We're not going to let go. We're still going to believe and still going to remember and still going to take pleasure in all those things that happened. You know, sometimes like when you get together as a family, right, you know, you come together with your parents or your brother or your this or that. You like to talk about the good old days, right? Like everybody gets a big kick out of talking about the good old days. Why do we want to talk about the good old days? Why do we like, why do we go at ah, that's a good old day? That's old days. Like who cares? Good, bad, ugly. I'm not even interested. Why do we talk about the good old days? Uh, it's a nostalgia. Okay. So nostalgia, what is, what's the nostalgia? Yeah, it it's just always, makes you happy. Always, uh... Yes, yes, yes. Nostalgia <laughs> makes you happy. You it's remember. Romantic. It's romantic. Yeah. yeah, it's a nice feeling. And then what it gives you hope. It gives you hope. When you remember the good old days, you remember, oh yeah, there are days that are like that. You know, once upon a time was real. It wasn't just like once upon a time there was. No, once upon a time there really was. So that's what the thing <laughs> for us. You just, you've got it almost like, like it says, everybody has to imagine in their head as if they were taken out of Mitzrayim. So one way you can do it, use your imagination, you know, pretend you're in a movie, fine. But other ways that people do it is imagine in your own life, times where you really felt like I'm never going to get out of here. Like, this is terrible. I'm never going to, this is never going to change. And, you know, this girl's never going to get married and my daughter I'll never see and blah, 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 blah. And then suddenly, bar Hashem, right? Like, I thought my life was over. This happened and I would never put myself back together again. Baruch Hashem, Humpty Dumpty got put back together again. You know what I mean? So that's what this idea of getting out of Mitzrayim is. Let's sit for a minute at the Seder. Like just, you know, this Hallel, you're going to be saying this at the Seder. You're going to be saying this. this uh, you're going to sing it. Yeah, you're going to sing it. So you're going to so like sing it with like what they call in Yiddish a geschmack, you know? Sing it with like, yes, yes, that was me. That was me. That is me. And it will be me over and over and over and over and over again. So it's, it's such a nice idea. So I just want to tell you a very, uh, very, it's a true story. Like this just shows you like the miracles, like what Hashem can do for people. What can Hashem do for you? So it's a true story. It's stories about this man. His name was Rabbi Herschel Berkowitz and he was from Ashdod. Okay, so he's making a, a wedding for his daughter and he was short of the funds, right? So he's thinking, you know what, he's going to go chutzlarts, right? And hopefully his brothers and sisters, meaning me and you, okay, <laughs> and uh, other people, his brothers and sisters, okay, brothers and sisters, chutzlarts, right, will help him in this mitzvah of, what do we call it? Hachnasas kala, helping someone who's getting married. So people make a mistake. They think, you know, helping someone who's getting married, you know, means uh, whatever, buying them wedding presents. It means giving them money to put themselves on their feet. It's, you know, wedding presents also. But I'm saying Hachnasas kala is not because, you know, the, the bride didn't get the most gorgeous dress. In any way, if you they have to where to live. live. Yeah, where to live. Like, exactly right. What to eat. Yeah, so what to eat. The real deal, Okay. So what's going on? He went to New York. He figured, you know, he's going to make his money in New York and he'll make his money in Borough Park. So he's sitting in Borough Park and he had hired, like for these people to get around, they need a driver. So usually these drivers, they're well-versed in, you know, where to go, how to drive and to whom 
to go. Like they know, like, you know, this house has this person and they're very generous and this is another generous house and blah, blah, blah. And they take these people in the car and they go. Now this is already costing this, you know, Rabbi Herschel Berkowitz quite a bit of money because you're paying for the flight, right? It now costs you money for, yes, to hire them. The driver also, you pay for the driver, right? And there's a certain percentage, okay? So he was supposed to come you know, at like at 5.30 in the morning, okay, so they were going to start right away, you know, these people are going to davening, it's a big mitzvah to give tzedakah before you daven, like, a, it's, it's, you know, it opens up the uh, gateways to heaven, so he's figuring he's waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting, but you know what happens? Nobody comes. But now the question is, what's he going to do? Like, he doesn't really know anybody or anything, so it's an interesting thing. He decided, you know, in Borough Park, there's a lot of Hasidim. So there's a Hasidish group, the Munkacher. So he goes, you know what? He sees a shul, says Munkach. And he says, you know what? I'll, I'm going to go to shul. I'll sit, I'll dive in, I'll say to him, what can I do? He wasn't able to reach the car guy. You know, he was just having a hard time. He's sitting there. He says, you know what? I am just going to sit and say to him. And I'm not going to get angry at the driver. I'm going to say Gamzula Tova, right? I didn't come all the way to, you know, New York to try to collect money just to blow up on this driver. Obviously, Hashem has his plan, okay? It all must be for a reason. I don't understand it, but must be for a reason. Anyway, sitting, he's davening, and he, you could see he was such a sincere person. This other person comes into the shul, and he's very anxious and looking around, and he sees this Rabbi Herschel Berkowitz, and he's davening, saying to him so beautifully, he goes over to him. And it's just like, excuse me, I hate to interrupt you, but I see, like, you have such um, Havana, you have such concentration, like, I have a crazy request for you. I have a terrible court case today. Terrible. I'm so worried. And I have a lawyer. And I, I and, you know, I'm, I'm going to be going in front of the judge. And I really feel I need Siata Dishmai. I really need Hashem's help. And your prayers, they look like they go straight up. So can I give you $500? And from this $500 merit of the tzedakah I'm giving you, you could please say to Hillen for me. Like, okay, I really would so appreciate it. Fine. Wow. Yeah, so he says, okay, fine, I'm happy to do it, a fellow Yid, you know, whatever, I'm, I'm glad, I'm going to do it for you, okay, and it's good for him to give the tzedakah, it's good, so he takes the $500, he sits and he's davening, and then the, the, the man who, he turned to the man, he said, please, do me a favor, like, just let me know how it goes for you, like, I'm concerned, I, you know, I want, I wish you had slach on bracha, okay, fine, so the guy goes, you know, gets to the court room, and he's waiting for his lawyer, like, he had a good lawyer, he's waiting for this good lawyer, guess what? lawyer doesn't show up he's like shocked like he's thinking oh my gosh and often when you're in a court situation the judges don't like usually people who try to represent themselves okay because they sometimes think they're balgaivas you know they're very full of themselves they think that they're lawyers you know so it's not always the best impression so to speak to be having to defend yourself on your own without a lawyer with you so the guy's like schwitzing. He's thinking, oh my gosh. He says to himself, listen, what could I do? There's nothing I can do. This is a situation I'm in. I have this, you know, Rabbi Berkowitz davening for me somewhere. And I'm just going to try my best. Like, there's nothing I could do. No lawyer is showing up. He's trying to call him, blah, blah, blah. He's like, you know, doing all these different things. And nobody is coming. So it's no choice. So the, you know, the, the judge asks him to come forward. Now you have to present yourself, represent yourself to, you know, say your case. So the guy comes up, he says his case, he's as honest as he is. Like he's, he was honest, honest about everything, straight as an arrow, tells over the whole story. And then he goes and sits down and he's thinking, oh my gosh, I'm finished. You know what I mean? I'm finished because the other people have a lawyer and they're saying their stuff. And he's thinking, oh my gosh, what's going to be? What's going to be? So now the lawyer has listened to both sides. Okay, he listens to both sides. And he says to him, calls him up. He says, you know, Mr. So-and-so, I could see you came without a lawyer. And the way you presented yourself, I could see that you were an honest man. And I'm going to drop this case. You have to, you have nothing to worry about. Could you imagine? Wow. The guy was so happy. He's turning around to leave. And guess who comes in? His lawyer. <laughs> and the lawyer is like, so embarrassed and he's begging him for forgiveness he said this has never happened to me but I literally slept in and then I got stuck in traffic he said I have never done this and in fact he said 
you know, he, 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 like, he tells him, you don't have to worry, I, I was free. So the guy goes, you know, in fact, you should know, I had intended to take $5,000 from you for this. <laughs> like, you know, I thought for sure you're going to lose. I'm going to, you're going to have to pay a fine. I'm going to get a percentage, like a whole big deal. He's telling him how I was expecting to make $5,000 today. So you should know I would never have done this on purpose. You know what I mean? Like it was totally an accident. So this guy says to the lawyer, you know, fine, Gamarnu, nice to know you. Don't worry about it. Have a good day. And as he's going back towards the um, base medrash in Munkach to speak to Rabbi Berkowitz and tell him like the great news. He says to himself, I was going to lose $5,000 today. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to give it to this Reb Herschel Berkowitz. Could you imagine? And he got to Reb Herschel Berkowitz. He said, I know your Tehillim made a huge difference. I was supposed to probably have lost $5,000. Hashem saved me. I'm taking that $5,000. I'm giving it to you for your Hachnosis Kala. It's a nice story true story. So this is the point. What is the point? This is our lives. Like, it's crazy. Now, don't think that this Reb Herschel Berkowitz, you know, was like, it was an easy story for him. It's not an easy story for him. Obviously, it's not easy to ask people for money. I don't care what anyone says. It isn't, right? It isn't easy. And it isn't easy to have to travel to, to New York where you know nobody and still have to do this. And none of these parts that these people played were things that they would say, yes, Hashem, make me poor so I could go to Borough Park. You know what I mean? Yes, Hashem, give me a court case so I could give $5,000 away. No, like people wouldn't, you know what I mean? It's not that we ask for these things. We don't ask for these things, but these are where Hashem put us in. These are our personal Mitzrayim. It's where Hashem puts you in. You're in your personal Mitzrayim. Now comes what you can do with it. So these people said, you know what? I'm going to take the root. I'm going to take the Hashem root, right? I'm going to put this out to God. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put this out to God. I'm going to have bitach. I'm going to have amuna. Shem is going to help me. I'm not going to let all this like Yetzirah that's coming in front of me, you know, like now he's not there and this isn't there and the car driver didn't come and blah, 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 blah. Like everything can just turn into a giant mountain. Like it's true. Okay. It really is. Okay. Dealing with life is tough, right? And things can start building and building and becoming so overwhelming. And blah, blah, blah. These people said, no, you know what? It's a Yisrael Mimitrayim. Right? I'm going to get out of Mitzrayim and I am going to do what? I'm going to be Hashem's servant. I'm going to choose to serve Hashem. I'm going to choose to accept. I'm going to choose to bring him into my life. And if I do that, then I will have Yitzias Mitzrayim. Right? So it's really beautiful. Okay, so Talia, what did you want to say? And then we're going to say our prayer. Okay, so Talia, what did you want to say? Um, I'm going to stop share for a minute. Okay, good. Yay. Now I can see everybody. Okay. So what did you want to say, Talia? Um, to forgive someone that they wronged you, it's, I believe it's like a way of loving a person, you know, it's showing their love for your fellow man. Oh, she hung up. <laughs> oh, no. No. Uh, anybody else hearing me? Uh, yeah, I am. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. <laughs> what uh, happened? She, she, she her, her, it froze. I hope oh, she comes cool. back so we can say for Shaduchim with her. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm sure it'll come back or she'll reboot or something. Okay. Hopefully. Otherwise, we hand it over to you. Pardon me? Otherwise, we'll hand it over to you. Uh. <laughs> you want, should I call her? I don't have her number, so I can guess. I don't think I have a number either. Let me check. Barbara, do you have her number? I wonder if other people got hung up too. True. Should we just hang up? Oh, 
Okay. Hi. I okay. just found out. Don't ask. It was like a little <laughs> the see the zoom split. <laughs> okay. And off I went. Can I can I can I repeat yes, what I ask your question? Yeah. So basically okay, go ahead. so to forgive someone for how they wronged you, it's a way to love your fellow man. It's to it's a it's a form of love that you have for them. A hundred percent. One hundred percent. 100%. It's not easy sometimes, but it's 100%. And, and really what you're loving in each person, I think, is that Selamelokim. You're really trying to love the godly part of them, and you're trying to look at the things that they do, are, which is hard. This is hard, but you're trying to look at what they do wrong, right? Generally speaking, is not who they really want to be. You know what I mean? And so I mean, it's not see. who they really want to be. Do you know what yeah, I'm so you're, you're, you're forgiving them you know, like you, right. you, you yeah. love them you, you know right. because you love right. them you forgive right. them and you love what part of them that selam melokim because that's really the authentic person this this is what's i think very hard right now because you're looking at a world that has turned like may am loways like very vicious you know what i mean very like people are very the whole feeling out there like this incredible tension like you just feel like things is bubbling at the surface like the very what's the word almost like the barbaric part of man like man eating man you know what i mean that's what you're feeling right now you don't feel like you're in a place of loving kindness you know what you're I'm saying? going backwards i just yes. said today a thousand years ago yes the time of yes. uh the cave time yes yes like the wild oh, west like whoever yes, had the right. gun was the there's one no, with the no laws no law and morals. order no nothing People, I, like they don't nothing could um, they behave like animal yes I look at the, the news in israel people oh look to God. me like horses they look like wow. like yeah. animals i don't see that because they're all running and black and they're, yes. they're yes. even the flag they're holding the flag of israel does not look pretty yeah it looks like yeah. crazy angry yes. Yes. It looks like it, it, yes. it doesn't look blue and white there. Nothing yeah. is blue and white. Yeah, like it looks red. That's what it it's, looks. Yeah, look fire. Hey, yes. gray. Yeah. That's what on, you're seeing. On the street. Yes. Oh. yes, everybody with, I feel like the world has like tons of frustration. Like that's just. I, I'm telling you, it's in a matter of 